Coming up next on this episode of the Unlock You podcast. Many of us are good at offering a level of compassion to others in their story, and sometimes really bad at offering it for ourselves. May I introduce the concept that there's parts of us. And while we think we're really good at offering it to others, if we're not also offering compassion to ourselves and our own story, our own traumas, whether that's big case, major macro trauma and abuse and neglect and rape, assault, natural disaster situation, or if it's low-grade chronic misattunement of parents being preoccupied, of having a relationship betrayal or disappointment or bullying or anything else that makes you feel ashamed, inadequate, not enough. Any of these categories can do great damage to our soul. And the fascinating thing is I've found in working with people who have been through satanic ritual abuse, human trafficking sold by their own family members, all the way to the spectrum to just a major singular event like a car accident accident or a trauma event like a home invasion or a rape or something, or a child that had parents, but they just were busy and workaholics and how that affected self-worth and self-esteem or being bullied at school or cyberbullying. Actually, it's less about the event itself and it's more about the impact of how the internal world structures after or as a result of those events. Hey friends, thanks so much for joining us. This is Unlock You with Dr. Shannon Crawford. I'm a clinical psychologist, leadership consultant, and a really big fan of you getting to fulfill your life purpose. I want you to get unstuck and unlock your potential relationally, emotionally, spiritually, and vocationally. Thanks for joining us and let's get started. Hello, my name is Dr. Shannon Crawford, and I'm a clinical psychologist, a leadership consultant, conference speaker, and podcast host of Unlock You, You Like University with Dr. Shannon Crawford. It is my passion as a Christ follower and a clinical psychologist to give you the tools to help you feel better, to be able to honor and process the grief that you have gone through. As a trauma survivor myself, I want to give you hope. I just want to start the conversation in a heavy talk on trauma, that there is so much hope. I want you to start with vision. Envision yourself at your pinnacle moment. You're in meaningful relationship. You're living a life of purpose. You are healthy and you walk in the fruit of self-control. You are enjoying your life. And that's our dream for you. Many of us, me included, have gone through various kinds of trauma and not all trauma looks the same. Sometimes we get hung up on comparing and trying to validate, is my trauma real? Is it not? And we can compare like, I'm not starving in Africa. I wasn't human trafficked in Thailand, but it's not really helpful or beneficial. That would be like saying I broke my pinky and they broke their leg. One is less valid than another. No, they're just both broken and they need to be honored. And there's such a beautiful principle that what we honor in ourselves, that same standard of compassion and kindness and understanding that we give to ourselves enables us to give deeper and richer understanding and compassion, validation to others. Many of us are good at offering a level of compassion to others in their story and sometimes really bad at offering it for ourselves. May I introduce the concept that there's part parts of us. And while we think we're really good at offering it to others, if we're not also offering compassion to ourselves and our own story, our own traumas, whether that's big case, major macro trauma and abuse and neglect and rape, assault, natural disaster situation, or if it's low grade chronic misattunement of parents being preoccupied, of having a relationship betrayal or disappointment or bullying or anything else that makes you feel ashamed, inadequate, not enough. Any of these categories can do great damage to our soul. And the fascinating thing is I've found in working with people who have been through satanic ritual abuse, human trafficking sold by their own family members, all the way to the spectrum to just a major singular event like a car accident or a trauma event like a home invasion or a rape or something, or a child that had parents, but they just were busy and workaholics and how that affected self 
self-worth and self-esteem or being bullied at school or cyberbullying. Actually, it's less about the event itself and it's more about the impact of how the internal world structures after or as a result of those events. So let me say that again. It's not the event itself. That's why we don't need to compare. It's not helpful to say, well, somebody else has it worse or I had it too bad. Like I'm so broken and it's impossible. Neither of those conversations are helpful. What is helpful is saying, this is my story. And Jesus in red letters said, in this life, you will have heartache. And in psychology, we call that word trauma. <laughs> and that could again be big trauma, big event. And it could also be just little events that accumulate over time and make you feel worthless or invisible, overlooked not good enough and an embarrassment in, in your own skin. Any of those events can structure your internal world based on fear. Now, let me pause and just give you a little bit of the science of the body. I'm going to try to stay really helicopter high level to not bore you, but I think it is important to just know a few of these concepts that you have in your central nervous system. There's two fundamental wirings. There's a wiring, a preset, kind of like a pre-dial on a radio station where you push not the radio stations are almost obsolete now that I say that, or your cell phone or something that's like, there's a preset. One is the parasympathetic nervous system. In the parasympathetic state, our pupils take in a normal amount, a broad range of view. Our heart rate is at a normal, calm state. Our body is not sweating or trying to run away from anything. We are in a state of rest and digest. We are able to attach, connect, enjoy intimacy. We're able to run after daring things and be brave and lean into adventure. We can access the prefrontal cortex, which is executive reasoning, long-term planning, focus and attention and personality. Also, a big part of that is language. Being able to use your words versus being so flooded that it's like words leave and, and you're just operating out of the back of the brain, which I'll explain later. In the parasympathetic nervous system, that's when our soul feels safe. And in a Western world that's kind of removed the spirit out of humanity and everything became very reductionistic, just about the body, that movement was called positivism. I don't know why they called it that, but in that time, that's what they called it. That if we can't tangibly put our finger on it and do like a study, then it's not valid. And that's not true. What we found is the psyche or the soul, that's the, the root word, which actually just means soul, the internal of man that we cannot touch. And yet we know is impacting is far superior in impacting the body and forming the body. In secular psychology, they think that the body informs the soul and vice versa. They put the body as the trump and then everything else under that. And it's true that we do get in that state, unfortunately. But the way God designed us is for your spirit man, the you that connects with the Holy Spirit, that's your eternal you, the destiny, kingdom, spiritual part of you that comes awake and alive when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's your spirit. And then your soul, mind, will, and emotions, the carnal understanding that the apostle Paul calls it, submits under your spirit. And then underneath that is the body and the body's being informed by the soul. This is an important distinction because in psychology, we default to medication thinking, let's just change the body and the soul will change by result. Now, this is not a conversation pro or against medication. Please don't think that. I'm just saying you don't start the conversation with the body. Body, you actually start it with the soul because my thoughts inform my body. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It's actually the internal thoughts of the soul and the spirit that inform how the body responds. In the womb, unless there's a rejection wound or something, uh, the baby does feel whatever mom is going through. So even in utero, if the mom is like feeling rejected or she's being beat up or she's feeling very anxious or insecure or doesn't want that baby, we know that the emotion can can cross the uterine wall and the baby can feel that emotion. So it can happen in utero, but for most people in the womb, we are fundamentally attached through the umbilical cord as, as well as just kind of knit together in this environment of warmth, hearing the security of mom's heart and everything just feels very peaceful and soothing and calm. In that state, 
your body is full of GABA. GABA, I think of like grandma. GABA is a neurochemical that turns off cortisol. Cortisol is the stress hormone that causes us to run away, adrenaline, you know, fight, flight, freeze, or trauma bond. That stress response is inhibited or turned off when we're in a state of GABA. GABA and oxytocin, that cuddle hormone that's really famous, where when you connect with somebody else, you feel held and secure. You have tons of GABA and you have tons of oxytocin in your system. Those chemicals from your soul saying, I'm safe, the body then tells the central nerve system we're in parasympathetic response. In that state, we are clear and we can think and we can hear God and we can make practical decisions on how to move forward and advance in our calling. On the other side, the sympathetic nervous system. Think of the parasympathetic as like the, uh, the accelerator on your car, that pedal. And then the sympathetic nervous system is that stress response of like, put the brakes on. I'm not safe. Fight, flight, freeze. And then they've added trauma bonding that sometimes we will bond with our abusers as a way to survive and cope. And it helps downregulate the central nervous response when we're in that hyper uh, anxiety, insecure state. So when we go through trauma, it's not just the event. It's how my internal world takes in the beliefs around it. Now, let me pause there because there's a conscious mind as I think, renew my mind, but also also, how do I think in my heart? Think of this as the conscious mind and your heart, that deeper place is where your unconscious mind is going. Now, this is really important because for myself, as well as a lot of people I work with, my original trauma was actually unconscious. So there wasn't a lot of conscious thought about an event I didn't even know that I went through until I started doing trauma therapy. Uh, well, let me back up. I actually just had low self-esteem, self-hatred, cutting, a lot of reckless behavior, a lot of self-sabotage and just self-loathing. And so I didn't know why and started working on that. And I had huge gaps in my childhood memory. And I had tried to go to a normal counselor at first and she rolled her eyes like, why don't you come back when you're not being resistant and you can tell me those memory periods. And I was like, no, literally I don't have memory for that. And so I went to someone else who said, well, maybe there's a reason that you don't have memory and let's ask the Holy Spirit to start revealing in the work of therapy, to start revealing if there's a reason you don't have memory. And now trauma memory started to come conscious. And so at the unconscious level, I had all this aborted grief that had never been processed. I'm using aborted, not like an abortion, but like held frozen. So there's different parts of my soul that had held all of this trauma on the inside for the singular event of a trauma moment and multiple chronic little attachment traumas that as a little girl, I didn't know how to process. So shock denial is a gift from the Lord. It's the first stage of grief. And it's just just like this invisible shield that just kind of insulates and comes around us. So we may not know the conscious beliefs that we're forming dur during a trauma moment. We are multifaceted. In Genesis 1:26, the Lord said, let us make man in our image. Emphasis on the Trinity, that Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they're three and yet they're one. He's one, singular, and yet expressed with different facets of his personality. Just like we are one, expressed with different facets at the body, soul, spirit level, but also within our personality, there's so many rich dimensions. You know how wisdom, it talks about in Proverbs about the seven pillars and the seven spirits of God, that the Lord is one. He's absolutely one, but there's this expression of all these different facets. Think of how you're made. You have an athletic part of you. You have, maybe, you have a uh, studious part of you. You have a romantic side of you. You have kind of an insecure side and maybe an aggressive competitive side. You have all these different sides of your personality. And in health, we're supposed to be able to go through all those sides of the personality so fluid and so automatic that we don't even notice the distinction. We just have the right side of the personality showing up for the right situation. But in trauma, that parasympathetic sympathetic response of the central nervous system can cause us to glitch. And the wrong side of the personality, that fear response to hyper vigilantly protect us in 
situations that maybe it's it's an overinterpretation and we're not really needing that. And so for a lot of people in an intimate relationship where they may say, I know they love me, or I know God loves me, or I know my church or my spouse or my family. I know that consciously at some level, but I just feel like they don't. I just feel unloved. I feel unworthy. I feel persecuted. I feel unsafe in this relationship. And a lot of people will sabotage a relationship they may consciously want because an unconscious part of the self is going, whoa, that's too scary, too intimate. Uh, there's way too much shame, you know, activating. And I don't know how to kind of navigate that. And so for all of us, we have this preset or pre-wiring that was developed really early in life. One of our earliest traumas is usually around shame. We have that parasympathetic state where I feel completely loved, flaws, broken and all. You can watch a baby who is pooping and peeing and they're like, come pick me up. Like they just have perfect self-esteem. That is a parasympathetic. I have flaws. I'm not perfect. And yet I just believe that you love me and you want to be with me. On the other side, the sympathetic nervous system is hide, kind of like Adam and Eve in the garden where they're hiding themselves. They're pulling away from attachment and relationship. They're starting to put barriers to protect themselves because shame tells me at the unconscious level that I'm broken, I'm bad, and I need to hide these things that will cause me to be rejected. How many of us are hiding what we believe will cause us to be rejected. We may not even realize that's what we're doing, but it's that moment when you sit to write your dream or to move forward with a, a destiny and a calling and you procrastinate. It's the moment where you want to call that person and let them know how you feel, but then you're like, I need to play games. I need to protect myself and talk, kind of talk yourself out of it and become wary instead of affirming and securing for them. It's that moment where you ruminate and your brain is a hamster wheel and you can't turn the thoughts off. Often that's a shame response because I'm afraid of living from my heart because at some level, I believe that my heart is broken or bad or not good. And so I have to live from my mind instead of my heart. So many of us have big trauma, medium event trauma, or low grade chronic trauma, all of which tell our internal world, I am not safe. I cannot be authentic and show up just as I am fully as I am. I've got to dress it up, mask it, hide it, perform it, gauge people and events and overly interpret and protect myself. In that state, we are in the sympathetic nervous system. Now, what's fascinating is the sympathetic nervous system, the eyes dilate and they just kind of take in the immediate, the foreground and not the big picture. So that's why we're more likely to end a relationship or get or fire somebody or quit or um, just throw in the towel on a project. And I'm not going to work on that dream career or entrepreneurial pursuit anymore because it's right now. It's just the fear. All I can see is what's immediately in front of me. And I lose the ability to think of long-term consequences. I get hypervigilant. I get scared. I get anxious. My thoughts just ruminate because there's so much adrenaline, but yet I'm sitting down trying to work. I'm trying to sleep or I'm trying to have a conversation with somebody, but my adrenaline is causing the thoughts to just swirl, swirl, swirl because fear tells me I'm alone and I have to protect myself. When we we have trauma of any kind. We have an unconscious belief that no one else protected me through that. I need to now step in and protect myself. On accident, that for a Christian as much as a non-Christian, that is self-idolatry on accident. I'm saying it in myself as much as anybody else. It just means who is the Lord of that area or that response. And what's helpful to know is God is a creator and he made us in his image. So that means I'm a creator and I get to steward creatively how however I want my internal world. As a little, little girl, I was super open and friendly and outgoing. And I wanted to talk to mannequins. I thought they were real, super embarrassed my brother. Cause I would just talk to the mannequin and be like, hi friend, you want to be my friend? So that was my natural wiring in a parasympathetic nervous system. And then I went through trauma, big specific event, and then low grade chronic and family, and then lots of bullying and rejection and peer relationships. And my personality just shrunk. And I learned to protect my myself. When I do that picture, it's like there's a part of your soul that says, ah, my job will now be vow. I will never, I must, I have to, I should. Yours are going to be different than mine. I'm just throwing my stuff out there to make it safe. So we're all in the same boat together. But one of mine was I will never let somebody reject me like that again. And so what would happen is I would reject people or events before they had the opportunity to reject me. Totally practical, makes sense how there's a part of my soul 
soul still running in the unconscious mind as the protector, trying to protect me from that ever happening again. You and I have these internal preset unconscious beliefs, biases that are held by literal parts of the soul. When something is painful, there's a wounded part of the soul that takes that deep inside that creates shock denial. So my defense mechanisms kind of just disavow or minimize like a computer, just minimize and quarantine all that pain. And then a different part of the soul now goes, I will be the protector. I will be the defense mechanism to make sure you don't have to think that feel that, experience that because it's too painful. We now have at least two parts of the soul that are running rogue, their own mission, metaphorically, on the inside, on the unconscious mind. While I am growing up and I'm smart and I'm educated and I'm getting a job and I'm in meaningful relationships, pursuing whatever your thing is. And yet now I have a a house divided. I have a conscious me leaning toward adventure and bravery and intimacy and connection. And then other parts of me that are frozen, what we would call regressed, like the age I was when that event happened, it's like it's stuck or frozen on the inside. And for that inside part of me that's frozen, you think of it like an archaic room. And that part of me is just kind of replicating or staying stuck in that dynamic, vowing, I will never let that happen again. In that state, I can forgive that person consciously. And the unconscious me still have that judgment, bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness still running in the background. And from that place, that's called a stronghold. And the enemy comes in through the door of bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, and a stronghold, and he can affect us at an unconscious level. That's when my clients, I had one that was a missionary, loved Jesus, gave her whole life to him, and yet constantly had this feeling of like, maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I'm not saved. It's not that the enemy just willy nilly gets to say that. There was a part of her that was not in relationship with Jesus. Now, I know that sounds super weird. Just hang in there with me. When you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your spirit man is sealed until the day of redemption. In the moment, you are going to heaven. And the Lord also says, now work out your salvation with fear and trembling. One is an automatic work of grace, positional sanctification. The other is my soul progressively yielding and submitting under his lordship for relationship. And that's called progressive sanctification. So we have the baby in the womb, ideally being knit together in a parasympathetic nervous system response, where you can run after your destiny and your calling and engage in the world bravely. But then most of us have gone through some level, some kind of trauma that then wires us based on fear. And there may be conscious parts of you that are still bravely running forward. And then you find yourself procrastinating, self-sabotaging, getting an opportunity and then kind of dragging your heels and you can't get yourself to figure out why. Or you suddenly are comfort eating when you're trying to lose weight and move toward a goal or spending a bunch of money when you're trying to budget and be a wise steward because there's other parts of you My biggest passion in life is for you to know you are not broken. There is not something wrong with you identity, right? Spirit man, you sealed in the day of redemption, you are protected. And like Israel going into the promised land, he is now inviting you to do one battle after another, one stronghold, one inner vow one bitter area of unforgiveness or resentment or uh, self-reproach or condemnation against yourself. He's going to invite you into seasons to say, yes, I will let you deal with this in me. That might be him asking you, do you trust me with your finances? And now starting to be really generous when the fear belief of if I'm the God of my finances, if I'm the God of protecting me, and he asked me to trust somebody, He asked me to submit under authority, uh, to really commit to a relationship or to tithe or to give to people or organizations. In that moment, what he's doing is he is trying to allow you to be aware that there's a stronghold down there. I remember, you know, I accepted Jesus at the age of five. And at five, for some reason, I just had the clearest memory. I knew that I knew 
Jesus is real and I am called to be a missionary. And then trauma, bad things. Oh my goodness. So much happened after that point. And let me just tell you, the enemy is a strategist. And he's trying to take away your identity, the core belief that you are good. So picture your internal world like a corporation or like a spy espionage, because I just like that. You can make whatever allegory you want to make, but you have a spirit man that knows that you love Jesus. You have said yes to him. And you'll also have knee jerk reactions. Like, uh, I feel like he said this, but I'm really struggling with it. Was that really God? When we wonder a lot, it's usually because there's a part of our soul trying to talk us out of it. And I can say as somebody who loves God and have never walked away from him, I have had so many ugly heart knee jerk reactions when things come up. And so I'm going to lead you through this, but I'll give you a teaser that when I walked in my imagination, not hypnosis, not new age, nothing weird, just in my own imagination, asking the Lord to show me what do the unconscious parts of me perceive about you? I imagine walking down from the heart, opening the trap door below the heart. Imagine walking downstairs, down another trap door and down deeper. And I just visualize the word God written on a door. Now, remember, I love Jesus and I have loved him my entire life. I open that door and I just see an imagined picture of Godzilla, that God is going to smash it and take it away. If I want something, he's not going to let me have it. So he took me back to traumas, life events that were traumatic to me, that then out of that experience, I made an internal vow and judgment against God. God's not going to protect me. If I want it, he's going to take it away. He doesn't care about the desires of my heart. And if I want it, I have to go get it and make it happen myself and almost hide it away from him. Now that's a trip when you say, You've loved God your entire life. You've never walked away from him. And yet those core beliefs can be formed unconscious without even realizing it. And that's what I'm saying. It's not the event itself. It's how my internal world creates infrastructure around those core beliefs of how I perceive what happened, why did it happen, and it happening again, and how I'm going to try to protect myself and how I'm going to try to comfort myself. And that's where comforters come in, false gods. Like in Hosea, it talks about the Lord gently kind of stripping her of all her false comforters. And in my twenties, man, the Lord took me through a stripping. I don't know if you've ever gone through a season where you're like one thing after another that he's peeling away. And you're like, oh my gosh, he was peeling away all my false comforters that I had learned to turn to instead of turning to him. So we have parts of self. And when we have something painful, a part of the soul will take that unconscious. What's fascinating is the Lord works in the light. The enemy works in the dark. When any part of me goes unconscious, any part of you goes unconscious, that part of you in an antiquated room frozen in that event is alone. Do you want to know how many people I talked to and even experienced myself that are in good relationships and yet feel alone? They have accomplishments and success and yet still feel empty. Even as Christians, they have all these accolades, they have all this accomplishment, they can be in a group of people and yet still feel criticized and not good enough and unwanted and still riddled with low self-esteem and inner self-critique. That's not broken. That's not something wrong with you. That means there's a literal part of your soul stuck in the unconscious, frozen in those thoughts and feelings and experiences. Another part of the self then becomes the defender protecting you from being aware that that's there. So you don't have to connect with that pain. And then that lonely part of you frozen in there feeling empty, not good enough, alone, unsupported, uncomforted criticized, attacked, that part of you is now going to look for comforters. It's going to look for false comfort in the things of this world. And so that's where we turn to comfort eating. People turn to, um, you know, online relationships or porn or um, 
romance books or movies or something or gambling or something that tries to fill that inside or addiction of substance. That's a common one as well, because that part of the soul is empty and alone, literally disconnected from Jesus, but also from ourselves. So the imperative with trauma is not just doing the focus on the trauma. Yes, do that. Absolutely. And now work through the internal infrastructure, the house divided, the parts of self that are running rogue, doing their own, you know, cold war, metaphorically, uh, mission to try to protect and defend and hypervigilant. That's all happening on the inside without our awareness. So I'm up here thinking I am loved, I'm cared about, I'm renewing my mind, I'm memorizing scripture, I'm in good community, and yet still feel not good enough, still feeling fat, even though you're not fat, still feeling unlovely or, or not strong or brave or powerful, still feeling less than in some way, going back to those old idols of comforters and old habits, because that's how our soul learned to comfort ourselves really early in life. I want to take the shame off that, that just positive thinking, willpower alone does not rewire the infrastructure of trauma. It's wonderful and it's essential. Willpower and positive thinking and all of those renewing your mind things, that is fantastic and it helps at the conscious level, which you need to do, renew your mind. And I'm inviting you into a journey of restoring self-cohesion cohesion back to the self where we were fractured and splintered through the, the life events and traumas we went through. The Lord is wooing those parts of our soul back into relationship with him. And the Lord is offering that experience through our talk today and through many more things he will lead you into in the future. This is by no means the one solve all, but it is an introduction to take off the shame of feeling like, why am I still dealing with this? I've already gone to a counselor and talked about it. I've already done such and such work or went to this Kairos or inner healing or freedom or whatever you've done. That's because it's not just the trauma. It's not just the memory and the event. It's also how your internal world structured itself because of going through that event and how that is literally still running as an operating system, like a hard drive of a computer and it's hardwired into you deeper than you think. When you renew your mind, you're upgrading your software. I remember one time I called uh, Apple computer and I was like, something's going on with my computer. I don't know. I've tried updating the software. I've tried rebooting it and doing all these glorious things that you're supposed to do to a laptop. And he said, uh, ma'am, your computer is from 2008. Your hard drive is really old and it's no longer compatible with the software you're trying to upgrade it with. At first I was like, hey, 2008 is not that old for a computer. It's expensive when you buy Apple. But anyway, the Lord spoke to me and he said, how many times are we using old wineskin, old hard drives, and trying to interface new software of renewing our mind, but not upgrading the heart experience of actually how did my relationship on the inside form itself? And that's what I want to do with you today. I want to invite you into the concept that you have parts of self. I'm not talking about DID or multiple personality disorder. I'm talking about the design of creation that a Trinity, a triune one God said, let us make man in our image where we have facets of self as well. And when I go through something painful, let's say the creative side of my personality goes, whoa, creativity is not safe. Whoa, they laughed at me when I brought out that drawing or I read that poem. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, uh. And so that part of me is now doing a job it was never intended to. And so we're hypervigilant, we're shame based, we're learned helplessness of not trying anything because we don't ever want to fail. We're perfectionistic, trying to do everything perfect, which is a, a super ego that's way amped up a little bit too much. In each of these internal world states, you're lacking something essential in your personality that helps you to lean in bravely and creatively because there's parts of you that are running in the background, holding that old operating system and it's competing or glitching as you're trying to go forward and read your Bible. And yet your mind goes blank. 
you try to give money generously and yet you feel this like fear of lack and you're not going to have enough. You're trying to be in a relationship with somebody, but yet always possessive and jealous because you don't think you're enough to keep them. There's these unconscious belief systems and they're not just nebulous beliefs. They're actually tied to a real part of your soul. And there's another part of your soul that's dedicated to making sure you never realize that that's down there. You kind of picture it like whack-a-mole. This symptom comes up and the defense mechanism goes, nope, that's not there. <laughs> and I think I'll put myself out there that the Lord showed me because one of my strengths is positivity. I learned how to Christianize and positivity my way through a lot of my trauma. And now it's great to be positive. It's great to be joyful. And I love that. But I was also using some of my strengths of my personality to defend and block and whack-a-mole some of my symptoms and trying to willpower myself through them instead of allowing intimacy and connection. One of the big principles you need to know in your trauma healing journey is that new insight of going, okay, this is the trauma. These are the beliefs. This is what happened has to be coupled with a corrective experience at the heart level. We have for too long focused just on mental ascent, understanding, knowing. Think about the self-help book industry. Every year, self-help books are one of the top rated sales of the year. And yet the next year, that's also going to be some new self-help book. If it really helps and it resolves, it shouldn't have to be every year a new self-help book comes out unless it's only getting half and we're not getting the other half through a corrective experience. So let me walk you through what that might look like, because this is a journey. It's not a one and done. And a lot of people have very unrealistic expectations that I've already talked about that. I already did that. And that's one layer of the journey. The Lord is such a gentleman. He is so gracious not to show me all of my junk and trauma and beliefs and unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment and all the things that's down there all at once. I would be overwhelmed and under a bed hiding for the rest of my life if I knew all that my soul had junk down there. But what he does is he'll take you one little layer at a time and then he'll give you a break. And that's the style of maintenance where you understand that this is a journey that you just kind of rest into relationship with him and say, okay, Lord, what does it look like right now? Yes, I've already talked about it. Yes, I've already done X, Y, or Z. I remember when a psychologist looked at me and she said, you have a lot of pain inside. And I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? I've already done X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, uh-huh. Yeah, you have a lot of pain inside. Because she could see something that my defense mechanisms were not allowing me to see. And may I be so bold to suggest that you also have some pain, some corrective experience in your heart that needs to tend to help heal and redeem, not just knowing that a trauma event, not just knowing that I need to forgive or I need to release the judgment or the vow, but also I need my heart to be mended. I need compassion. I need kindness. I need my soul to restore trust and intimacy, even within myself. I need my soul to be sanctified, which is saying, okay, Jesus, I'm allowing you to be Lord and savior of this part of my soul. That's been running its own rogue mission back there. I'm now acknowledging it, bringing it in the light and asking you to disciple mature this part of my soul. I remember one day that I, you know, I'd gone through months of saying, don't worry, God, I won't do that again. Don't worry. I won't do that again in my own strength. And you know what happens, right? I did it doubly worse the next time it was terrible. And so what ended up happening is the Lord said, you're trying to disciple yourself. You're trying to do my job. Instead, when I finally just fell on his grace and repentance said, God, I can't do this without your help. I surrender. I cannot do X, Y, Z area of life. I cannot repent, uh, repair it on my own. And when I repented and I laid before him in surrender and tears, it was like there was a grace and a stronghold being broken because there's a part of my soul that I was trying to do it in my strength to impress him, which came from family of origin. A lot of us come from that, right? We're trying to be good enough and please and perform so our parents won't be disappointed. 
that gets projected onto God. So I was trying to do his job for him. So he would love me and not be disappointed in me. But what that did is it kept a lot of things out of relationship with him. The Lord is inviting us to stop freaking out about the symptoms, to not dwell there so much. You know, if it's dangerous, you focus on it to the amount you think you should. But I'm just saying there's a deeper layer. And the Lord is inviting us into intimacy, into corrective experience at the heart level. So I'm going to ask that you'll join me. If you feel comfortable that you'll close your eyes and erase the chalkboard of your mind, just clearing those thoughts, the rumination, the noise, the chatter, and let's go down to the heart space. The Bible says, guard your heart above all else, for it is the wellspring of life. And many of us have gotten disappointed and we have a heavy weight on our heart and it's hard to hope. It's hard to live from our heart and it feels safer to live from our head and our intellect. But the Lord is calling us to reawaken our heart, to peel these layers off. To the right and to the left, just letting him peel these layers off your heart. And let's go ahead and just visualize there's a glass ceiling over your heart of unworthiness. So many of us feel unworthy. Whether we ever consciously thought it or not, many of us feel unworthy. So let's ask Jesus to help us break that glass ceiling of unworthiness that's been over the heart, hindering us from receiving, because we've still been doing it through works and performance and effort. And now let's picture taking the lid off the top of the heart, and let's just let his rivers of living water straight from his throne room, just imagine Colorado crystal clear water, super refreshing, just starting to fill, excuse me, fill you up. Let's visualize if it feels safe to you, this comforter blanket, gentle, not too tight, not too loose, just kind of wrapping around you. Let's just breathe that in and let comfort wrap around you. Isn't it sweet that one third of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit is called the comforter, counselor, paraclete, which means helper. That God knew in this life we would have heartache and we would need his comfort. Not the comfort of food or porn or addictions or anything else or people. We would need his comfort first and foremost. Okay. And so now let's just picture we just draw this shame part of you into awareness. Now, for some of you, this might be really hard and challenging and your mind might be blank and that's okay. The more you do it, the more you activate your imagination, the more you can connect with your inner world and help it feel safe. But for those who can, let's picture that either it's a shame part of you that's kind of balled up in a room inside of a room hiding, or a shame part of you that can come in the imagination in the heart center. And then a defender. Yours might be uh, control. Many of us use the illusion of control. If I have a plan, if I know what's happening, then I can protect myself. Some of us, it's people pleasing, just making sure I never disappoint or let anybody down. So I will be a workaholic. I will be perfect. So no one's ever disappointed in me. And I never feel ashamed or unwanted or not good enough. Some of us, uh, we might use religion and performance and trying to achieve and earn God's grace. When that's a finished work at the cross and he doesn't need you to prove yourself to him. He already chose you at the foundation and the creation of the world. He chose you. Jeremiah 31, three is one of my life mess, uh, verses. Therefore with loving kindness, I have drawn you. He is drawing you, not your performance. And if you can, let's just visualize inviting Jesus to come and love the shame part of you and the defender protector part of you. And we hand him those rule books of the operating system. Those parts of us have been living based on unconsciously. And we ask him to be Lord and savior of protecting us from shame instead of me protecting myself. And we ask him to be Lord and savior of the shame part of us. That's been holding all these feelings 
And if you can, let's just visualize letting him hug you. And like you're going limp in his arms and just letting yourself be safe. Now, let me give a caveat. For some of you, you might have had an abusive authority figure who is male. You might have been molested or a rape or something. And sometimes it's hard to visualize Jesus as a male hugging you. So one, I just want to normalize that. That happens a lot. And it's not something perverted or weird about you. That's just how the unconscious projects our life experience. Some people, uh, when I say picture Jesus, if they have sexual trauma in their background, they might see a penis and it makes them uncomfortable and feel weird when in reality, it's just the unconscious mind generalizing a male hurt us before. And so when we say Jesus to the unconscious mind that doesn't yet know him, knowing him as sanctification. So this part of me has been in hiding. So this part may still be projecting past people, authority figures, abusers, unsafe people onto Jesus. So if that happens, one, you're normal and you're okay and he loves you. You're not bad or gross. Two, you just picture taking that mask off of Jesus's face and say, Jesus is not like that. I break that projection and belief. And I welcome the reality that Jesus is the kindest most self-sacrificing, loving, patient, good friend that I could ever imagine. I take it out of a romantic context if you have abuse in your background in that context. And so whatever your story is, you may come to some roadblocks. Your Your mind might go blank. And that's not because there's something wrong with you or that it's not working. That actually just means you have a defense mechanism activating going, whoa, Whoa, getting a little too close. Did you know your defense mechanisms are actually not against other people? It's against you knowing your own places of pain. Just like the nerve endings of the, on your, the palm of your hand, they hit something hot and they pull back. I don't even have to think about it. You know, like if you're holding something hot and you just drop it, it may splash and get everywhere because I'm not thinking through the decision of what to do with that. I'm just distancing from pain. The Lord parallels how he does the inner world and outer world, that if we have inner pain, it's often very similar to how the outer world does it and vice versa. So our defense mechanisms, when we get to certain places that are close to pain, your mind might go blank. You might get distracted or all of a sudden think, what am I going to eat for dinner or lunch? You know, what is on my to-do list? I need to go do laundry right now. That's just a defense mechanism. So the best thing to do in that moment is to write it down and go, okay, what was the last thing I was thinking about or focusing on or question I was asking right before everything kind of went blank. And then you stay curious and you ask the Lord, okay, what am I trying to defend at an unconscious level? What is my soul trying to defend and protect in that trauma, that shame, vulnerability, rejection, abandonment, whatever's down there. And I invite you to come love this part of me. He's at the door knocking. In Revelation, Jesus says he's at the door knocking. And do you realize he's talking to the church? He's talking to the believer, not to the unchurched, not to the unbeliever. That you and I have areas in our heart deep inside that I'm like, I don't want to go there. I don't want to think that anymore. I used to tell the Lord, Father, would you just take away those memories? Would you just help me not remember that anymore? And he did as a gentleman, I needed that for that season to just not even have the memories. But what happened is by not having the memories, I didn't have those parts of me and the lies, those parts of me were believing were still active and running in the background and still creating an open door for the enemy to bring torment, fear, insecurity, anxiety, dread, depression, all these doors through those memories I didn't want to have. Now, again, there's a time to not remember. That's great. But there's also a time, just like in Ecclesiastes, there's a time to build, there's a time to tear down. There's a time to rejoice, there's a time to mourn. And we have to go back and finish the grieving process all the way to full term so that we can get to acceptance, that we can extract the shrap metal out of the wounds in our soul that we can allow God to finally heal, including getting angry. Anger is a stage of grief. So do you remember how I said I had like all self-harm and self-sabotage and all these ways I was angry and hurting myself? I had no idea that that was latent or unprocessed grief. 
as a little girl, I didn't know how to express my anger. I, I thought that was going to cause approval to go away. You can't express anger. So I just buried all my anger and anger that doesn't go out. It goes somewhere. So my anger that wasn't going out against those that I wanted their approval, it was going against me. And the enemy was allowed through that stronghold to bring extra torment and all kinds of things through that. Uh, like there's just so many layers to the sophistication and magnificence of how God has wired our soul. And so here's just a few things I want to leave you with as you are on your journey of trusting God in trauma. There's hope. You're not defined by it. You, what's permanent about you is not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. And it's not going to take forever. It's not going to be as hard as you think. It's also not magically going to go away. All time does not heal all wounds. <laughs> Oh, sorry to tell you, it actually kind of like a broken leg. If you don't go to a doctor and get it set properly, a lot of times it'll fuse kind of in a funky way and misalignment that then causes the hips to be out of alignment, causes the spine, the neck, headaches, numbness, all kinds of things can have a ripple or auxiliary effect from that original break. The same here. You're not broken who you are, your spirit man, the eternal you. And your soul and your body have been wired with fear and self-protection. And so in that misalignment, it is causing symptoms and it's affecting you and me. So it's not as hard and long as you think, but it is a dedicated process, a journey of saying yes, day by day and allowing that grief and that healing of honoring each side of your personality, almost like different camera angles of the same event. And that's why we go through like, I'm normal. I feel, oh my God, I'm sad. I'm, I'm miserable. Oh, I'm normal. Oh, I'm really angry and upset. Oh, I'm normal. Oh my gosh. I'm just, I feel anxious and upset and I can't sleep. And I just feel all oh, you're going through grief stages. Just normalize that, accept it, lean into that, trust that it's a process and it's worth it. Because as a trauma survivor, who's, I don't know where I'm at, maybe 90%, I still have some work to do. I can tell you life is fantastic on the other side. Saying yes is amazing, but you have free will. You don't have to say yes. Jesus is at the door knocking to certain memories, thoughts, feelings, symptoms, not to just reprimand you like Zeus but to say, can I come in and sup and have intimacy with this part of your soul? Can I have a relationship with this part of you that you've been ashamed of and trying to hide? You're worth that to him. You're not only worth dying one time. He is every day pursuing your heart. His mercies are new every morning towards you. Not because you're good enough, not because you don't make mistakes. I sure do but because you are valuable to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is pursuing you. He's awakening you. He wants you to live from your heart and your spirit man, which means clearing out where the soul has had strongholds of self-reliance, self-protection, self-defense, self-idolatry of trying to find our identity through things of this world. He is after your heart, cleaning house, pruning for your good. So you can be more fruitful. So you can run after that destiny, that calling that he has made you for. And he wants you to enjoy intimacy, to know yourself, to be glad, to be valued, to love yourself as you love your neighbor. And out of that expression, you can't help but love others. And you can't help but love him with gratitude that I feel known, I feel seen and loved just as I am quirks and flaws and imperfections and all, I am excited for you to have this journey of restoration, of restoring parts of your soul that have been running rogue, doing these weird background antiquated operations of protection, now being restored. And this is the last thing I want to tell you. I have seen in myself and in so many clients as a clinical psychologist and a leadership consultant, I have seen people become more creative, more brave, more entrepreneurial, 
able to pivot and leave the security and the safe of a paycheck to really run after that dream that's been in their heart, but they didn't have the, the courage or desire or focus or ability to do it before because they kept self-sabotaging or they keep uh, procrastinating or something. There is so much locked inside of you. So if you'll join us in this healing journey, I know there's so much out there. My stuff is great. There's other people as well. I hope you get plugged in with the Unlock You, You Like University with Dr. Shannon Crawford podcast and community. But there's also so many more and God will lead you toward different resources in your healing journey as you go. I hope you find a really good therapist who specializes in trauma. I hope you find good community community and relationships, mentors, people who can walk this journey with you. You don't have to do it alone. I love you guys. And I bless you with peace. Hey, thanks so much for watching this episode of Unlock You. It is our dream to invest in you. And one of the ways you can do that is by getting more of the bonus material, the content, and to know about future events, head to the website, drshannoncrawford.com, subscribe to the newsletter, and you'll be the first to know what we're rolling out. And we want you to truly get unlocked so that you can thrive, not only for yourself, but also for the greater calling on your life. Let's link arms and do it together. See you in the next episode.